Okay, our multi-image panos have been stitched. Now it is time to bring them back into Darktable for final processing. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 75 of Understanding Darktable. Yes, new video intro. We'll talk about that later. This is probably going to be very concise now because this is my fourth attempt at shooting this video. Okay, so we've stitched our panos. Now we want to bring them into Darktable. Now, when I produce my panos, they get exported to my Data3 drive, which is not my photos drive. So I could either move them in my Linux file manager to my photos drive and then import them where they are, or I can simply import them where they are and then let Darktable move the images for me. So I'll click on import image. We can see here, media, USR, data three, Hugen panos. I've got my three panoramas right there. I will apply my basic copyright metadata on import, click on OK, and Darktable will automatically open the last of those images in the darkroom. We will jump straight back to the Lightroom. I want to select those three panoramas and in the selected images module, click move. And from here, I want to go to my photos drive, photos, uh, personal projects, 2020, 2020, 11, 11, Remembrance Day, select as destination. Darktable will ask me, are you sure you want to move the files? Yes, I absolutely am. So now they have been moved and they are in the same folder as all of the source images for those three panoramas. While I've still got those panos selected, I will go to my tagging module. Yes, sunset, let's attach that. Let's also attach panorama. And let's also go Sydney Harbour. I'll go Circular Key, Sydney Harbour Bridge, and Sydney Opera House. And that'll do for tagging right now. That at least gives me the basics of what I would want in any tags for my images. Okay, let's have a look at all three images before we do anything else. Let's go to the first one and we'll go full screen. So that's the first one that's stitched beautifully. Not a fan of the water. Also not a fan of the light, to be honest. It's just a bit washed out. There's not enough detail in the buildings in the city. The lights from those buildings is not cutting through enough to really make this interesting. It's kind of a bit ho-hum, to be honest. Second image, worse. The third image is probably the one that works the best out of the three. So as you will recall from episode 74, this was when I was shooting 30 seconds at a time with the six-stop circular polarizer. And as I suspected, because the sun had gone down, I was able to get away with using that filter like a six stop neutral density filter. The polarizing aspect of the filter didn't really come into play because there was no direct sunlight. So I was fortunate enough to get away with breaking that rule. There are, however, a few issues here. For one, hot pixels. I thought about applying the hot pixels module at the time that I was exporting the RAWs to TIFFs ready to stitch. And I thought to myself, ah, screw it. I'll just, when I bring the stitched pano back in, I'll run the hot pixels then. And of course, what do I find? The hot pixels module only works for raw images. So, word to the wise, if you are shooting long shutter uh, multi-image panos, and by long shutter, I'd say anything over about two or three seconds, you will experience 
varying degrees of hot pixels. Now, if hot pixels is a new concept to you, basically with any digital camera, whether it's SLR, SLT, mirrorless, compact, doesn't matter. Whenever the shutter is open, there is an electrical charge flowing through the sensor. And what happens is, as you should remember from your high school physics, whenever there's a lot of electricity, you are going to generate heat as a byproduct. And so what happens on a digital sensor is that certain photo sites, those are the little buckets that collect light on the sensor, they overheat and they cause these random colored pixels that we can see right here. Things like these colored dots that are just random all over our image. Now, like I said, I thought to myself, oh, I'll just do it when I bring the pano back in. But no, it has to be done on the raw files. So if you are shooting multi-image panos with a shutter of, I would say, anything over about two or three seconds, you're probably going to get some hot pixels. So when you go to export your raws as TIFFs prior to stitching, make sure you include the hot pixels module so that you can deal with those hot pixels as you're exporting to, to the TIFFs because you won't be able to do it when you bring the multi-image pano back in. You live and learn, people. All right, what else? The problem with trying to shoot a multi-image pano, dealing with changing lighting conditions as well as trying to have your head in the space of I am the director of a video shoot as well as the on-screen talent for a video shoot, basically trying to wear three hats at once, caused me to make what I can only call a newbie error. What we've got here, these streaks, is one of the Manly ferries coming in from Manly to dock at Circular Quay over here. And what's happened is it's come into the frame as I was shooting that leftmost first image. And of course, they're 30 second exposures, so all of those lights have caused these long light streaks. Then I've rotated 10 degrees or 15 degrees. Oh, yeah, because this was shot on the Manfrotto head. That's right. So I've rotated 15 degrees, shot the next 30 second exposure and got the exact same light, light streaks on the next frame. And then I've come across here, and I've got them again. And of course then, by the time we get to the fourth or fifth frame, the ferry is this massive light over here. <laughs> so, you know, if I wasn't trying to wear so many hats at one time, I probably would have been aware of that. And I would have just waited a couple of minutes, waited for that ferry to get into Circular Quay. And, you know, to be honest, I could have just waited for it to get to about here. And I could have then started shooting my first frame. And by the time I got to shooting the second frame, he would have been probably over here where where this the, the ferry is now. <laughs> so, yeah, newbie error. Also, look at the water texture. That second frame just stands out like the proverbial dog's bollocks, right? It's just a case of not a long enough shutter speed. Again, if I'd had more time, if I wasn't trying to wear three hats, I would have put on the 10-stop filter, let each of these exposures run out to four minutes, eight minutes, whatever it was going to be, and that would have smoothed the water out a lot more, and I would not have had these variances in water texture. To me, that's a, a bit of an annoyance as well. Also, and this was outside of my control, have a look at the north pylon of the bridge here. It looks like some sort of transparency error but it's actually not. <laughs> Around here behind this tree, there was this two-storey scaffolding light tower. 
and there were these guys up there, and they had these like massive big spotlights, obviously with a gel on the front, with a checkerboard pattern on it, and they were shining it on the bridge. And I don't know why. I don't know if they're preparing for New Year's Eve. Seems a bit early to be doing that in the middle of November. But anyway, for whatever reason, they were shining this pattern on the pylon of the bridge. And obviously there's nothing I can do about that, you know. Uh, so when I saw these images, when I you know got home and I imported them into Darktable, I was like, oh my God, are you serious? Anyway, it is what it is. So there's a few things about this whole panorama that, you know, not happy about. The pattern, the hot pixels, the light streaks, the inconsistent water texture... But, all of those things aside, it's generally come up looking pretty good. So, in terms of post-processing, it really doesn't need a lot, to be honest. It certainly wants a bit of contrast adjustment, because I feel like the what should be black, like the shadow under the bridge and on the eastern side of the bridge here, that should be black, because that was absolutely well, it's on the near side of the bridge when the sun is set over on the western side. So the blacks need to be blacker. So I would probably go with a good old RGB curve here. And what I would do is press the O key to turn on my over and under exposed indicators. I would then zoom in here. And I'm just going to crush the blacks a little bit until I can see the blue pixels. That tells me that I'm clipping blacks. And I really don't need to go too far. That's probably about as far as I need to go. Just turn that indicator off and turn the module off. That's without. That's with. That looks much better. Turn the indicator back on. Just have a look at the Opera House over here. Yep, that's okay. What I do notice is that this side of the image went really dark. And we'll come back to that in just a sec. But for now, in terms of the blacks for the city and the bridge, that's working for me a lot better. The highlights, I just want to push the mids. Oh, turn my indicators back on. Are they on? There we go. They're on. Uh, until I see some reds starting to clip there in the sky and then just back that off until yeah I'd, I'd leave just a couple of pixels clipped just so that I know I've absolutely maximized my dynamic range for this image and to be honest I don't think I really I don't need to make an S curve of this I don't think because we run the risk of it getting a bit too dark although ooh, that is looking pretty nice. That is looking pretty tasty. Uh, let's turn that off. Turn the module off. Ooh, that does look nice. But it's super dark over here on the left-hand side. And I do feel like, oh, that's not too dark on the Opera House. Yeah, no, I could live with that. Okay, so if I was going to go with that kind of a curve to apply some contrast to the entire image... The question is, how do I deal with this left-hand side of the image where everything is a little bit darker? I would probably introduce a second RGB curve, and I would just open up those deep shadows a little bit, and then I would apply a drawn gradient mask, which we need to turn around like so, something like that. We need to shift and mouse wheel just to soften the fall off of that, bring that across a little bit. Maybe we need to lift that a bit further. Maybe to about there. That's not looking too bad. Let's have a look at that mask. Yep, that's pretty much the area we wanted to process. I think that looks all right. Turn that off. Let's just turn the module off. 
and back on. That's not too bad. There's a little bit of a dark patch in the sky there that I could probably spend a bit more time trying to even out, but that would be my basic approach to just lightening up that side of the image um, just so that it didn't fall into deep, deep shadow like it was. Beyond that, I don't know that there's really much more I'd do. If I was going to print this, which obviously I'm not because of all of the aforementioned issues, but if I was going to print it, I would definitely apply some sharpening. And of course, it would depend on what kind of media I was going to create. Like, if, was it a paper print? Was it a metal print? Was it a canvas print? All of those would require, you know, different approaches to sharpening. Uh, but I would apply some sharpening if I was going to print it. I guess the last thing I would do is just the crop. Now, you're probably wondering, why did I not crop in Hugen? I have found in the past that quite often when I shoot a multi-image pano like this, in my extreme bottom corners, I'll always end up with something. It'll be a footpath, it'll be a road, it'll be a fence. It'll be something that appeared at the extremes of the, the panorama that just kind of encroaches on the corners. And sometimes you think, if I crop those out, I'm going to lose something else of interest that sits higher up in the frame. And so you could try and, you know, apply some healing and cloning to get rid of whatever those artifacts are in the corners. There's nothing here that I that really fits the bill. The Lady Macquarie's chair pano that I uh, showed you in episode 74, that did have a little bit of footpath in the bottom left-hand corner. And... I didn't want to just crop above that footpath because there was a certain building. Let me go find the image. I'll be right back. Okay, so down here in the bottom left-hand corner, there was a bit of a footpath that was visible and I didn't want to crop above it because I wanted to keep this building here, which is well, used to be called Center Point Tower. I'm not sure what it's called these days, but I wanted to keep that in the frame. And so what I did was I did a very rough, bodgy job of copying some water texture into the corner there so that I could keep the Center Point Tower in the shot without uh, including that footpath in the bottom left-hand corner. So that's kind of my thinking. Now, this has been a bit of a long way around of coming to sometimes the pixels that you want to use for the cloning and healing, and this might sound counterintuitive, but they can be pixels which will eventually end up being cropped out. Sometimes they make for a better source than what's actually inside the crop. So that's why I tend not to crop in Hugen if I think there's a chance that I might need to do some, you know, healing and cloning in the corners of my image. So let's just jump back to our Sydney Harbour pano. So we don't need to do that in this particular case. So I will go crop and rotate, switch it on, leave it in freehand crop. I just want to crop off the, that scalloped edge along the top. I don't want to go right down to the top of the pylon. I want to leave a bit of blue sky there. We'll do the same at the bottom. Crop that out. I'll come in just a little bit on the left-hand edge to make sure I've got rid of any black pixels that were down the left-hand edge. And on the right-hand side here, I think I'm actually going to get rid of all of the, the tree and the sandstone along the waterfront there and just crop it to that. For me... That's probably the most natural crop for this particular image. Like I said, so many things about this I wish I'd done better. 
you know, not least of which was taking more time in the production of it. Uh, but the problem with shooting at blue hour is you don't want to take too long to produce the, the panoramic sequence because your light is going to change too much over the course of the, the shoot. So you kind of need to work reasonably quickly. All right, guys, that is going to do it. Um, <laughs> somebody said, is this going to be another Douglas Adams trilogy? Guess what? Yeah, it is. There is going to be a fourth part because after I released the first two videos, episodes 73 and 74, quite a few little bits of information have come through the comments, uh, both here on YouTube and on the Dark Table Unofficial group on Facebook, with just some just some things that I hadn't considered or some things that I didn't know. So what I'm going to do is compile all of that feedback. There's some bits of uh, research I need to do as well. And I'll probably address all of that as a fourth installment in this sequence of movies and that'll be the end of the multi-image pano stuff and i only say that because i realize from my youtube stats that not everyone wants to do this uh, these last two videos and probably this one as well have not received as much engagement as i normally see on my videos and i think that's just because it's a bit of a niche market not everyone wants to shoot and produce multi-image panos like this particularly when you know hey you can walk out there with your smartphone and just put it in panorama mode and get yep yeah, and it's done so i get it that just about does it we're almost done uh, the new intro i've been wanting for ages to do something a bit more creative for the intro to this uh, channel's content and as you may recall, about 18 months ago, I jumped from Magic's Vegas to DaVinci Resolve uh, as my video editing platform of choice. And Resolve has a module called Fusion, which allows you to do all sorts of motion graphics type stuff. And over the last couple of months, I've been watching a ton of YouTube video tutorials on how to use Fusion most of them from Casey Farris. That guy is awesome. Uh, definitely check him out if you haven't already, if you're into producing your own video content. Well, if you're using DaVinci Resolve. Uh, so yeah, so anyway, I spent way more hours than I would care to admit putting that together. The sound design probably took me about half an hour to do because that's easy, because that's what I do for a living. Um, but yeah, the video stuff took me quite a while. Hope you like it. Uh, I know some people hated the old doo -doo 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 -doo. so be uh, content that that is gone you'll probably never hear it again okay the last thing that I want to address is for the patrons only um, patrons are you aware that I produce extra content that is only viewable by you guys the reason I ask is because I've been looking at my YouTube stats and it seems that quite a few of the additional videos that I've produced just for you guys have only been viewed by a quarter to a third of you. And I figured it's probably one of two things. Either A, you, you're just not that worried about the additional content, you are just happy to support me in what I do, and once again, thank you if that's the case. Or two, and this is probably the more likely scenario, you weren't aware that I was putting up this additional content for you. And I figured, well, that could happen. You know, if someone's gone to patreon.com slash understanding dark table, they've signed up as a patron, and then they don't follow the blog at patreon.com slash understanding dark table then they may never know that i've been posting these posts because when i put up this extra content that's the only way you'll find out about it now i did think to myself well surely patreon would send you as a patron a notification to say hey this content creator that you're supporting has just posted a new blog post or has just released a new video or something but maybe that's not happening i don't know 
So anyway, I just wanted to bring it to your attention, just in case you weren't aware, uh, it might be worth going and checking the blog at patreon.com because there's a few videos there that I know some of you have not seen. But if it's a case of you, you know, you're not worried about the extra content and you don't want to watch it, that's absolutely fine. No problem there at all. All right, people, that will do it for this one. I will catch you in the next one.